The last time we spoke was the 12th of August 2010, and um, Alec had just won pipe annual. Right. Wow. Right. And uh, I saw you told me. Uh, and um, we had a very good interview. We covered Balamina and all the rest uh, and uh, all the history. And it oh. came over very clear. Uh, the final uh, segment was on uh, the Halifax Citadel and 78th Highlander School of Piping. And there's a development society been formed. Okay, so they're, they're, those two things are completely different, um, except they involve piping. The Halifax Citadel is uh, the military fortress where we work, uh, Parks Canada Project, and they support a piping program because it's a reenactment uh, living history museum. And within that, sponsors the grade one band that we have, which Alex is the pipe major. Um, so that's the one side of the competitive Halifax. The development society has had some big developments. Um, the big one in the last year is that we were able to change the name. And that was an important milestone for us. When you form a nonprofit in Canada on your website, or you can, you can call it whatever you want, but with the Canada Revenue, you cannot be a foundation. You are a society until you have acquired a certain amount of money in your, uh, in your coffers, which they say is a, as an actual foundation for success. <clears throat> so to hit that milestone last year was, was just sort of 10 years in the making and really, really uh, big because we've run it you know, pretty well like a mom and pop shop, just little drips and drabs. And I've liked that because it's taught me how to learn how to fundraise on a small level. And then we're starting to look. So the society is now called the Gandhi Piping or the Gandhi Bag Piping Foundation. And what exactly was it set up to do in the first place? And how did it develop from that to its uh, present uh, uh, um, actions? Well, it, it was set up as a way to, and we, I talk about this and I like to reinforce it, it's a way to, for me to pay forward all the stuff that I got when I was young. I've never been a fan of giving back. I don't like that terminology because it implies that I owe these people something. You know, the Jamie Troys and the Warren Fells, the Hal Sanix, all those people that helped me in the band when I was a kid, they did it because they did it. They, it I didn't owe them and they would be terrified to think that they did that. But to know that someone's paying it forward, it's just a mental thing from a lot of reading. So I like to think of it as I'm paying forward all the good I was given and the great stuff. And I've really seen that develop in Alex. So we, I set that up originally after a series of a few events in 2011, uh, a health scare and a couple other things. And I thought, you know what, there's people coming yet again to help. I need to do something to give back where I can and where, where can I help? I can provide funding to deserving pipers. That's not always the poorest kids or the, you know, the street kids or anything. It's, it's, it's deserving pipers. And that could be, it's mostly young people, but we've given some out to some scholarships out to adults and stuff that are grade three and two or four pipers that help a lot in their community and really sort of add to the strength of lower level piping. You know, they go to piping schools and stuff. They need help too. They're just you know, some folks are regular blue collar workers with a couple of kids and to shell out that money. So it's been a really good, we've had an opening concert. We've had a couple of fundraisers. We're in the middle of planning a new competition fundraiser that went over really good a year or two ago. And Alex is really enjoying becoming part of it now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of where it's come. And it's now a true foundation. 
Alan, in a piping moment, I have to step away from the camera for about four seconds. My chanter is staring and the sun is coming in on it. And that's not good. <laughs> no, a, any, anything that interferes with the chanter and the-, the well, I, just put it, I just put it up out of the case and I see the sun <laughs> shining in on it. Oh uh, no. Uh, right. <clears throat> and what chanter is that that uh, you were using? Uh, that's, uh, that, that for the last geez, several years now, we've used the Gandhi model of uh, chanter that we got produced from McCallum. And that started really back in 2003 from an old Sinclair that I had received from Ian McClellan. Um, I loved it. It was beautiful. It was vibrant. The holes were this big, though. And I knew that it was it was getting hard on my hands to play clearly or it was going to break. Mm -hmm. So I took it to Kenny and Stuart and we started to develop that. We made a pretty big change in 2011, 15 and 17 or 18. And Alex has been involved quite a bit in the last two changes. So we're at a place where we feel like the chanter is comfortable now. We did a few things that I, I think I'm proud to say we were the ones that started to bring the holes back to a manageable size. I am a lot just of getting out of hand there, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, and a lot of the newer makers were doing it. And physically, my hands can't manage that. I can play one in the band because if I don't make a perfect B strike or every burl, but it's in time, then and you can get away with that in band. But you can't get away with that in the boards at Glenfiddich. And I needed it, you know, and with age and just, just physical problems, I have a hard time with that stretch. So I needed to get it just ever so slightly closer together, the holes. We did a few other things, rounding out the bottom hand holes slightly. So it gave it that feel of a chatter that's been played for 15 years, comfort in your hand. And that's where we've kept it. And, you know, the, that was one of the things. The other thing was that it had to have a, a neck. And I'm not sure, to be honest, how they did it, but a neck that would respond to making good Pevert G's, no matter what reads. Yeah. Had. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the instruments on Saturday uh, at the Glen Fidder uh, were remarkable. But again, there's instruments that just weren't right, uh, which surprised me because out of the 10 papers that are competing, you expect probably irrationally for everybody to have a perfect bagpipe and on the day that just doesn't happen um, and some of the leading lights and some of the lesser lights uh, played great they all played great tunes but I was struck that individual notes been well out in some occasions you know and it spoiled the, uh, a lot of the tunes and also the clarity of fingering that you allude to, it was quite striking uh, that uh, the winners did come away with very, very clean fingering, whereas others, the gd and E's are a wee bit muffled, this, that, and the next thing, you know. It's a very, very difficult thing to project uh, in a hall, away to the back hall, very clean uh, playing and all the rest of it. And I suppose that's been your pursuit over the last 10, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, to, to go to that, I didn't find, I found there was a couple instruments with a few notes, not horribly bad, but enough that, I'm, you know, if I had to judge it, I might mark something on my sheet just as yeah. a reminder. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it's the first year in that that room has been full again. Yeah. And if, Immediately, I remembered back to my first couple times there when the afternoon became really, really difficult to play in because the stage was hotter than the people in the audience even felt. And that was the problem on Saturday with the tuning. It's the Glenfiddich. And everyone knows that they need to present their very best. And you know when the pipe isn't quite right that it needs another minute and you know how to do it. But you also know that it's like, it's still 
it's not finished going up in pitch or something here at times. And even those who came in and played for two or three minutes on a near perfect instrument when they started up, as soon as they touched it, you went, oh, okay, that's made it better now. They were blowing it in tune and obviously realizing I can't get through the whole set. Yeah. Staying. So now I need to adjust it. And that room is just roasting. And, you know, in talking with Alex, I sent him a text saying, uh, come on in and hear one or two in the MSR before you get tuned up. It's really hot. And he went, okay, thanks, dad. Um, I'm going to, and he turned the heat up in his own room to try to match it a little bit. But even then, you know, he had, he had difficulty with the tuning, um, just with the heat. Fred, uh, in fact, most of the people were tuning some, some tune and take time because it's a nerve thing and you just want to be sure. I know I've been guilty of that where you felt you were in control of the instrument, but you just weren't quite ready to start because you weren't sure. But Saturday, I found there was a lot of people who were having a bit of a trouble just dialing in the pipe. And that had to be room environment. And I noticed a bit of the clarity thing too. And I don't know if that's players just getting a little too tight or nervous, or again, just the acoustics coming through the room, you know, because I, I did sit and I had nice chats with uh, Ronnie McShannon and Dr. Angus at the dinner who were at our table. And we didn't get into the ins and outs of the day. It wasn't right, but they inferred that, you know, the playing was really nice up there close. They could hear most everything coming through and you could do it. So it's, it's always hard as good a room as that is. I think uh, some of them uh, and the clarity thing, uh, I get the impression sitting in the back of a hall that was a slight edge of nerves and as much as they didn't hit the tempos that they wanted to hit and they were just a wee bit too bright in their tempos occasionally. Mm. And that contributed to the lack of clarity and maybe a suspect or a real uh, sort of thing, you know? That, that could be right. And I will be the devil's advocate on that one again and say, I don't think it was tempo because I actually had this out and was checking tempos on a lot of them. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm an advocate for proper tempos. I want my marches at 68, 70 for sure not 62 and 64 like a couple did play. I would have zero time for that. However, when I was tapping out in tempos, there were a lot of people, and that's the nerve thing, that were getting ahead of the beat. Yeah. You know, and when they're, when they're leaning yeah. into it on the front side of the yeah. beat, that gives a yeah. false impression that the tempo's too high, and it's actually not. There was a few stress bays that were at sort of the, the nice tempo, the 116 to 120 range, but it sounded like they were playing at 126 because they were edgy in front yeah. they weren't really they were just not playing in time and it's easy as a spectator to say they just weren't playing in good enough time but right. whereas you know i did happen to notice someone who was able to handle that and you can argue yes no technical pipe whatever but it was noticeable that angus mccall did his usual he just floated along and he was hitting beats when his foot was hitting the ground and not so much that you could hear the beat and he was he was in the pocket, as they say. Quite yeah. Possible. Very, very difficult. Uh, especially at that, uh, you're talking about the, the, the top competition and all this, and uh, when you're trying to differentiate, I don't know how the judges did it, uh, quite frankly. You know, uh, I thought it's possibly, uh, from a personal subjective point of view, I thought it was a... Uh, Maybe a wee bit better in the uh, MSR to sort them out than uh, maybe the Peebra, you know. Uh, but uh, again, that's why you have judges, different judges every year, because everybody has their own views on the subject. But that's right. I mean, the, you... the likes of Willie McCallum, for instance, I thought was outstanding, you know, in the MSR and uh, Connor. Uh, also, uh, Sinclair, you know, but everybody put up a, a very, very good performance as usual. That's exactly right, Alan, and and it's it's it is opinions, and I mean, and you really get down to the tone. I'm always telling my students, the tone has to be 
acceptable first, which we wouldn't expect anything less from that as they go, because that's the first thing that the audience hears is the sound of the instrument. If the instrument doesn't sound nice enough, it doesn't matter if you're Don McPherson, nobody wants to hear it. You know, and then we have, are they, is the technical work good enough which is an ongoing thing. And uh, you know, this level, we're not talking about chokes or squeaks or anything like that, that the stuff yeah. that you hear in the juniors. Yeah, yeah. But really, and then it's musical. And what is your preference of tone, technical? And we've had discussions of like, I don't know how you separate those two, those two people's marches, for instance. And I'll say, you know what? Player A got the tune that he's comfortable with the right temperature of the day, feeling relaxed, and they hit the tempo that they wanted, and that made the tune flow versus player B, who was every bit as good, but maybe that tempo was a beat quicker or slower than they intended, so they didn't get their full emotional self into it. And that's something I look for at the end. I, I need to trust myself and tell myself that at the end. You know, and I actually have shirts now that my practice shirts and from my company that say, play the rhythm and it has the, it has the heart rhythm on it. And it's just play the rhythm, brucegandymusic.com. Cause that's what I tell myself at the end, get the pipe, make sure you assume you're not gonna make any hand mistakes cause you've practiced and it's too late if you do anyway, but play the music because it's all about the listener, not the judge and the rest will hopefully take care of itself. Music is sick. Uh... The thing that's been a big uh, topic of discussion over the last few years, getting away from the mechanics of the, the tune and the digital exercise and all the rest of it. And I, I remember even your first interview, you uh, were quite passionate about uh, producing music uh, and the tune rather than just playing notes. Yeah, I, I work pretty hard on controlled playing or something I was brought up with controlled rhythmical playing and it wasn't it was never acceptable to play an e doubling exercise up the scale I had to play it a dot cut a cut dot in stress bay time in march time rolling them together like they were horn pipes so that all of these embellishments actually did what they're meant to do embellish the tune where I hear I do hear a lot, and I talked about it years ago somewhere else, what I termed as perfect playing, but there's no variety in the embellishment. It's the exact same style of uh, movement. And the easiest example is, you know, when you hear someone playing a competition march, those burls need to be tight, sharp, rhythmical, and heard, but you don't have a lot of time. But that same burl does not suit by any means the crossing the inch. No. Which is a more rhythmical, open, rolling thing that hopefully matches all of the treblings or peles, as people call them, movements. So there's stuff like that that I look for. And I've worked with Alex for years on that to always think of how we make the embellishments work to help the music. Because, yeah, this, this sort of playing and double time, playing perfectly, it just does nothing for me, you know, except it's right. And, and that's where it ends. But it, what's happened that I still see is happening. And it's nice that it's coming out now. But there was a good few years, just a few years ago, where the tempos were really coming down. Yeah. And some judges were saying, and I argued with them, oh, you know, you, you need to bring it back so you can get the phrasing and the music out. And I'm like, no, you don't. Um, I have perfectly good quality cassettes of you know, you and you playing at Inverness in the 80s, in the 70s, and those tempos are not slow and the playing is beautiful. I mean, it, there was a time when it got too quick. I'll agree yes. That, but there's a there's a big sort of range. Uh, you told me about John Burgess is quick uh, playing the MSRs and all that sort of stuff. But, but it was full of life and character as well. Yeah. It was manageable. You know, and it wouldn't win a prize today because there's some technical errors in it. But if he was playing like that today, he would probably still hopefully keep a lot of character and then tidy up a few of the things that were just not being accepted now. 
Well, it's amazing uh, how the, the styles change <coughs> decades, and maybe not amazing because it's different generations who have a different take on how to express their music. And that's a good thing because it would be boring if it was the piping today was the same as it was a century ago or half a century ago. And it's good to hear it all developing. And just to go back to your, uh, your uh, school of piping again, um, how many people have you got that you maybe teach or, and uh, what form does the teaching take, et cetera? Well, I mean, I'm a full-time teacher. So between local students <clears throat> and my online base is, is, is pretty big. It's probably 40 plus people with some, you know, somewhere every week, some are, I guess the bulk are bi-weekly. And we're, we're in a process, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that I have got the online presence because there's just not enough. And, you know, when you start teaching and have some success at it, you create good teachers, something that uh, cuts into my lifestyle of teaching full time at home, but makes me really happy that, you know, Alex is teaching a lot. Another fellow, Blaze, teaches quite a bit. One of my young students, Jillian Blaney, who's a good grade one amateur. Uh, I've had her for maybe 12 years now and she's teaching a lot of kids. So that's, you know, that's a great thing for me. We're working on trying to get into the school system. It's been a long struggle. And, you know, as we film this today, uh, it looks like it's gonna happen finally in January, but I'm, I'm just not positive until I see those first 10 kids coming in and learning that it's, going to happen it's you know I'm calling people over here and trying to find different methods to teach just one to make it more exciting for me and see if there's a better way to teach them um, the skills they need but also to fast track it a little bit I think that's just the way of life now you know when you grew up and I grew up Alan we learned every kind of technical movement possible before we saw a tune yeah. which I always tell people that was a hard go at the beginning, but I remember when I, when the Terebus was put in front of me, I was able to play it, you know, in, in sort of 10 or 15 minutes with help because I knew everything that had to be there. But I fully understand that you can't keep the interest in young people now if you don't... Much gone to the attention span now, I think. <clears throat> yeah. The, the ability to concentrate and the... the, the there's too many distractions now, uh, computers, TVs, and all the other competing interests. Well, and yeah, and I mean, they have, I, I, I always ask myself when I say they can't concentrate long enough, and I, I'm not sure that that's what it is, but too many competing interests are, and people seem to think they need to be involved in so many things that they don't get to dedicate enough time until we, until we can hook them in and get them into the band and then go, okay, you know, much like you're on the hockey team or the football team, we need you there three times next week because there's a championship. You can't do that for the first year or two in piping. You just have to hope they can come once a week and they do their work and stuff. And, you know, if this works in, in Halifax, it'll be a, a great movement forward. The Dartmouth group, we've partnered with Dartmouth and District because we had a few years where both sides had a small, call it a kid's band, you know, lower level band. But we thought it's just, we need to get them more help and we need to partner because we're just not in a big enough area with enough people to support two systems. So we sort of support the Dartmouth system and they're growing up with their grade five and their grade three band. And hopefully we can work that through to feed our grade one band and then we also help teach them. And maybe it'll grow again if we can get it back, but it's all a case of funding and having the right setup, the right people. And that's why I'm trying to contact as many people as I know who I can have a chat with in different areas of the world who are, you know, in Scotland, I'm trying to get a conversation with Scott Nicholson in Australia, because <clears throat> he's done really good with that boys band there. And, and just see how, how they're going about it to see if, there's always a better way. And I want to know hey, that hey, to grow the program. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, 
there's two things going on here. Uh, you've got pipe bands and a premises for the pipe bands to play in, to practice in, and it, that's got to be in person, I assume. Correct me with that one. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the personal individual teaching, is that in person or is it Zoom mostly? And if it's Zoom mostly, how do you go about uh, teaching people successfully using Zoom or FaceTime or whatever? Um, I would say currently right now, I have more, much more Zoom than local. Um, I wish it were different, but it isn't. And so that doesn't matter, the ratio. Zoom, you know, I've been on Zoom and Skype for really just about as long as anybody has at the beginning and started it back in 2004 or five or something when connections weren't good enough and things were really rough. But most of my student base are well equipped with a good computer system, which pretty well everyone has now. That's been solved. This, the speed of transmission is I wanna say in most places effectively quicker than it needs to be now. I remember before people had satellites or stuff and, and there was such a, a, a delay, it was impossible. I get people now that have a camera that's as good or better than what I have. You know, they get a, a, a good 1080p or camera and a fast connection and they have, have a really good mic set up and you can set the levels up and I can sit like this, which I do. And they know, you know, when I'm pointing to the, I'm going to be talking about drones and I'll go like that for my outside drone up or down. I mean, I can hear a lot of them good enough. And I'll say, I'll go, no, no, no. And I'll go like that. Get your base right. Get your base right. Because that's, they don't know, but that's a big thing now. And then I'll take my own pipes, usually with a reed, not my, not my solar reeds, but another read, maybe my band read, and I'll say, now, do you hear this? Now, if I do this, can you hear the difference? Yes. So you, we're closer to being live and almost three-dimensional with the cameras as well as we used to be. So it's not ideal, uh, but it's, it's certainly better. It's very difficult still for the transition to bagpipes to help people out. And I, I look really hard in my geographical head to, for anyone that can help any of the people that I'm seeing or new people, yeah. you know, you got to get to the local band or something just so you can get standing in a circle playing away and learning how to strike them up and take them down and physically play. So you can play, call it three, four, fours in a row. And you know, you physically can start the pipe. Maybe the attack isn't perfect. That doesn't matter, but I can start them. I can get them up. I could play three, four, fours. Physically, I have the stamina to do that. Now we can actually work on the tuning too. And I, I try to use whatever creative way I can. You know, sometimes it's drones only. Sometimes I'll just get them to play a chanter only just so they can hear it. And it's just whatever combination as well to keep it interesting. That's interesting. Hey, of course, we've all found that hey, it's, it's impossible to play along with a... Hey, the, the person uh, that you're teaching. And uh, that's a wee bit of an impediment or even singing to them as they're playing. Or, uh, so that's got to be done A, B, A, B sort of thing, you know. Um, I, changed, I, have a, I have a method for that too. And again, it, for the pure beginner, it's not that good. But one of the things that I have developed that I really enjoy is not telling people what's right or wrong all the time. I'll say, you play it and tell me what you think. And it forces this person to actually be aware. And so they're not just lights out, playing away, think, oh, I hope my teacher likes that. It's like, they know I'm going to ask them. <clears throat> you know, they'll play often on the pipes. And I'll say, so what do you think? And then when we play something, I say, okay, now I've got a couple ideas here. And what I'll do is I'll say, let's play it on the chanter together. So you play along with me. I'll mute my side because I'm not going to hear it because I, I have an idea. For instance, 
you know, they're rushing off the phrase ends constantly. You know, maybe they're playing. <clears throat> And I hear that, but they don't know that because they're playing it all correct. So I'll say, let's play it. I'm going to count in with two and I'll play it. You play along with me. By the way, I won't hear it because I'm muting this side and you don't get that feedback then. And so they can play along and I'll say, now you have to trust that I played it really good. Hopefully that's why you're seeing me. What do you think needs to be improved now to make your sound like mine? And they almost always will say, oh, yeah. I, or the other thing is, boy, when you get to the third part, I couldn't keep up. You know, the tough third <laughs> parts, the tough third parts of marches. I, you know, they're playing. <clears throat> and they realize, well, they're way behind me. And that's just a great learning thing because not only have, do they now know that they're playing behind in the third part, but they know it because they heard it and figured it out themselves. So it gives them the ability to improve instead of me going, oh, that was fine, but you were slow in the third part. I didn't play over the top, yeah. The old school of, oh, that's wrong, do it again. That's wrong, do it again. I never, I never tell them that's wrong, do it again, unless it's the first time of the day. And they'll say, okay, you're warming up. You've got it in the soft disc. You know the notes. Now let's do it for real. It's funny you mentioned third parts of marches, and Jimmy Watt said uh, he always had a wee trick about that one. I uh, he said that if you wanted to know how to play a march comfortably, it says start playing the third part and to get that comfortable. It says that's the tempo you used to start <laughs> the march at. <laughs> that's, he's exactly right. <clears throat> he's exactly right. <laughs> It, it, it demonstrated with the model a Hellenders, for instance, you know, the, the third part of the model Hellenders and all your uh, uh, Torres or gd &E's, whatever uh, set in your plane. Yeah. It, it was exactly right because if you started off too brightly, the first and second half, you were struggling on your third part. So wow. it, it, that, that's that, a great that was idea about pipe bands, uh, the expression of marches and pipe bands as well, you know. so. I, I, I agree. It's, you know, uh, there's a dot and a cut and the, the size of that dot has to vary between beats and placements of the beat, <clears throat> you know, or the first or the third note in, you know, in a two, four march, it's always different. And we don't hear that a lot as well when I'm judging. You know, you what, hear the dun, 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 What do you think about um, the reels? Um, uh, various competitions now, uh, I'm talking about solo piping competitions, I'm not talking about concerts and uh, all that sort of stuff and gigs, kitchen piping. I'm talking about actual, uh, we'll say Glenn Fiddle, for instance, uh, playing a real round, uh, whereas when it was composed maybe half a century or longer ago, I was composed with uh, dot and cuts. Uh, uh, what's your view on that? I think that, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> I think that evolution and style has a lot to play. For me, honestly, reels haven't changed since I've grown up. In my head, they're, they're, they're played the same as I hear a folk music person playing a boran. I've always been a fan of a real, that needs to be a dance tune. And I found, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a hypocrite here, but I found like sort of that West Highland style is the absolute best real playing. Having said that, when Willie McCallum plays strictly dotted and cut reels with the beauty and control that he can, that's a different level as well. But a lot of people try to play like Willie McCallum and don't realize that Willie has a strong beat and a lighter pulse and a strong beat and a lighter pulse. When he played, you know, deep ba da da deep da dum ba da dee dee da da dee deep ba deep and da da dee da dum ba da 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 and da. He the thing was forward and back, pushing and pulling all the time. But other people that try to play that, they play deep ba da dee da dum ba da dee da da dee deep da dee da, and it's all the same thing. Exactly right. as the as the 
bagpipe writer would do it. I would say Roger McDonald's yeah. band say that he played. Yeah. Uh, Funnily enough, uh, Stuart McCallum plays that tune all the time when he's competing, and uh, it's, it's a really nice tune. It's of a course, tune. It, it was really steered in that direction for that tune, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I almost don't play that tune because I know it's in Willie's list all the time. I played it for, <laughs> for quite a few years, and it's a big hit for Willie. And it's like, uh, it's not one of. It's one of those where I, I don't want to play it because that guy plays it. Plus, I don't want to have to be compared to that guy who does a great job of it. And I'm probably would be a little rounder and more open, which is how I originally heard it. Slightly rounder, slightly more open, and. There's people that play round though, which we call round. And I, I, I'm always a fan of Matheson who said an open groove. And I like, that's a really good description of it because round playing when I teach these bands is awful because there's no defining pulse. So it ends up being 16, 18, 22 notes all the same length. And you're going, what, what is that? <clears throat> the, the feel it's good because everyone played it right, but there's no done, da, 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 done. Da, da, yeah. that, that, that yeah. driving pulse has to be there right. that's my feeling for reels and I've always tried to lead them in, an, in a very open round way where in my head I'm not over pointing them and I try to drive them along and it, I have to do for me I have to do everything I can to keep them back to sort of 80 beats a minute because I like the reels it, 84 and 86 and let those things just go and that's I think you know when I started to become I guess a good grade one player before hitting the pros you know a big influence for a few years at that time was Ian Morrison and he was out to Vancouver and I saw him a couple of times I got a little bit of time with him then and I just thought and and then hearing him play at the Leith Pipers and listen to him to play traditional reel and the Nest Pipers I'm going that's awesome I want to do that, you know, and even then the guys would go, oh, oh, no, it's getting away from you now. It's too quick, but it was just a style. You would be uh, very proud of uh, Alec, uh, uh, first of all, uh, qualifying and then com uh, competing on Saturday at the Glen Fiddler Fighting Championship. And uh, he gave a good account in itself, the fourth in the MSRs. And he uh, so how was your feeling sitting in the hall listening to Alec? Um, it's, it's not as bad as it used to be, I can tell you that. The Peeber, I was, I was glad he got the tune he got. Um, he had a little, just a little water trouble with a drone. And I, you know that I believe that that was enough to sort of put him out of the prize list. But I'd like to, I almost want to ask the guys, although it doesn't matter, if they would have considered the tune, because I thought he played a a really nice musical peabrick. The MSR, you know, I'm really fortunate because I hear him quite a bit. I also, you know, sort of had my backside handed to me a few times this year by him, which helps me to keep going at a top level when we're playing at the local contest in Andy Ganesh or Fredericton, Maxville. And I, I, you know, I've just come to expect basically perfection out of him. Not in that I expect it to be perfect, but I just, when he plays and starts and the pipe's right, I know it's going to be really, really good. And I usually know that because he's so well studied and so well practiced and disciplined. And he takes it very seriously to know that his hands need to be in shape so that when he plays MSRs, that's not even a thought in his mind. It's how long is each note going to be rhythmically you know, and we just always talk about that. I don't get onto him about if he's playing at the house ever, you know, a doubling here or something there. I'm, I'm always saying something to do with this beat is not matching what I hear over here. And you're, you're losing a drive or you're gaining a drive and maybe you're just pushing a little too hard here or something. And so his playing is, is I think it's really quite remarkable right now. He's been going great since 2018. Um, you know, missing a couple of years. He wasn't a fan of the online thing, which was fine. And then, you know, he had a really good tune at Oban being second as well. And people were saying that was awesome. And, and I actually had said, I don't want to be that guy, his dad, but I'm telling you, that was not his full stride. 
that was sort of only 90% Alex there. It was good, but not what I was hearing in the room and at my house. And at Inverness, he, he definitely turned it on to the point where he played. And I thought, oh my gosh, who is going to beat that? You know, and so it's it's just great to listen to. So what, I'm what was the results of Bottom at Auburn and Inverness? Sorry? What was his results, Auburn and Inverness? He was second in the former winners at Auburn. And yeah, I heard them. They are very, very good that like I was in them all <clears> so it was excellent. Yeah. And then he won he won the former winners for the second time at Inverness. Good. Excellent. He, you know, he, he there's some people that came up and said some pretty astonishing things to him that night, which were sort of in my thought pattern, but you don't want to say stuff like that. I mean, just the, the instrument seemed to be smoother and richer than many that were there, or at least as good as anything. And his delivery was as smooth as I can remember from some of the all-time greats. I thought, oh, geez, you know, it put me in mind of one certain outstanding player that is not with us anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> and I thought, you know what? He, he just, he had that same... And you can watch the video. It looked like he was having a cup of tea in his living room. It just not a care in the world while he focused and played, you know, and where the rest of us generally look like, you know, we usually got some tension up there. You can see but he didn't seem to have that. And because he's comfortable with not just that six tunes, you know, another, another 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is Alec, uh, is he a full-time uh, teacher with you? No, no, Alex, he's got a, quite a few local students that he works with evenings and weekends. He's, a, well, he's currently off right now on parental leave for another week or so. And then he's back. He's a financial advisor with Royal Bank. Oh, well, that would pay your uh, lucky bills and all that and no Scotia. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I'm glad of that. I, I've always... So the local life in Nova Scotia, Ali, we never really covered that to any extent. He gave me a couple of sentences and that day, folk all over the world. For instance, I was speaking to Singapore the other day there, and I just put that up last week. And I think folk would be interested in uh, Singapore. And it was amazing, the, the, the COVID thing, how badly it hit them uh, and all that sort of stuff. But I think... I get the impression that things would have been slightly easier where you are. Um, well, I'm not sure I can answer that because I wasn't able to be there. Um, I, you know, I was over here for the, the secret COVID Glenfiddich to play. Yeah. And I would say it was, I mean, the lifestyle here versus the lifestyle at home, I would say was pretty close to the same. You know, you had to social distance everywhere. You had to mask everywhere. You were really careful who you want. I mean, Alex and Chantel and Colin live only two and a half kilometers away and we've walked there and Alex would not come within 10 feet of us for till late, till June or something. I mean, it was probably yeah. three or four months, which was really, was hard on all of us, but especially his mom. And we finally got a day out where the weather turned, much like here, and it was May and Bev and I were out for a walk and said, we're gonna come up for a walk. How about making us a drink? And, you know, it was a surreal moment of, we get to see our kids, we're outside and he'd set up two of the lawn chairs and, you know, the red drink cups, because I said, you know, text them, we'll be up, we'll be up within 10 minutes now, because we just walked. And so we had, Bev and I had our lawn chairs here, and they were sort of 15, 20 feet away over there. And we had, yeah. that was our first sort of interaction together. And Alex, I mean, we were worried, of course, but he was more worried, because at that time, he was still working at the bank, masked up, and he was often someone who had to be at the front door if he wasn't seeing a potential client. Most of the client work could be done over the phone or Zoom unless they had to be in to sign a paper. But other people that had, had to come in because not everyone's on online banking, especially old folks, 
getting their their monthly checks and stuff and we're just not familiar so he was at the door with the string of questions to check everyone to, before you let them in make sure they do their hands so it was pretty frightening at that time in Halifax I don't think I wouldn't say any easier than elsewhere and we got those pockets like you had here that you know got COVID and it's yeah. killing people you know like mm -hmm. a lot all of a sudden and, and so I got to think it was I, you know if it was worse then God bless them but it wasn't it wasn't pleasant you know we lost touch with our kids and stuff except thankfully in the world now we all had this you know, we had Zoom and Skype and stuff we could see our families and friends with. The, the only thing about it is that uh, is, uh, Alan Wilson I was speaking to in Singapore, and they all stay in high flats with paper walls and couldn't blow pipes or play drums or anything, and they had no pretty place to practice. So they were more or less just wiped out. There were bands wiped out completely uh, because of that. Uh, they couldn't meet people. Uh, they were confined to these uh, small spaces in their flats, this, that, and that. So it just killed the, the whole music uh, thing completely. Whereas out in Nova Scotia, and for a certain extent for us, I've got the garden back in front and all that, all that sort of stuff, like meeting relatives and friends sitting out in the garden. It was great. But these people didn't have that uh, facility and don't have that facility because it's a, such a tight uh, population yeah. with just high flats end off. Um, I, I can see so, that. Uh, you, you, you're, you were able to play pipes out uh, in the open and practice and keep things going and maybe even supervise folk from a distance uh, if you, you would see them out there. But they, uh, some parts of the world, like Singapore, Hong Kong was the same and all the rest, they, they, they very, very difficult uh, for the, the, the hobby of music, if you like. Um, I, I can agree to that. Um, but here would be two little things. We can play outside from maybe some point in May to September. The rest of the time in Halifax, it's too damn cold to be outside. <laughs> Where in Singapore, if they can get their pipes and find a bit of an area in a park, they probably could have played. And I say that because we had a couple of people there are a few people in our band that live in condominiums and apartments and they tried to get into their office buildings in the evening to do recordings for the online contests and stuff and they couldn't and it was ended up being such a hassle to get there and you know the, the prep for it and set up and you know the recording didn't work right the first time and that it just they ended up giving up and two of them were, were um, Blaze and Jess Terrio in our band them, you know they had an apartment they just couldn't do it uh, a lot of the time where I was able to downstairs in my studio and I, I chose to play as much as I could in the first sort of year and a half. I was trying to play contests for a few reasons. One, to show people how to do it. Two, to keep my own level of playing up. I was worried. I thought if I stop playing for a long time, I'm done. I, I just won't get it back. And three, to support the groups that were actually putting the effort in to run these events. You know, they need people doing it. And if it would help that I played, then I played. And But again, I managed for about a year and a half, and then it just it kind of burned me out. There were a few games. You know, if we had to do this all the time, there would be more advances. Mm -hmm. But for me... I was not a fan at all of the uh, what's currently out there sometimes where you can make a recording and you can do it 20 times if you need to. <clears throat> and the promoters say, we want your very, very best recording for this competition. And I'm like, well, it's not a competition anymore. Then it's a, it's a recorded LP like we did in, yeah. the studio in the 80s. I want like what Vancouver and a Boyne did where they had enough people to say, okay, Bruce, your peabrick is at 12 noon. We'll call you, you know, one minute before. And I knew that at 12 noon, my time, and I was going to play the 
the MSR at it was 145 or something. Those were my times. So I got dressed in the morning just as if I was going out to the games and I really tried to visualize the whole thing. Here I am, I'm going out to Andy Ganesh or somewhere local, down the stairs, quick blow of the pipes, they're fine. Okay, I'll go have a cup of tea, right? It's 1130, let's get these pipes humming. And then I've got the camera ready. I've done a quick test to go, okay, I'm ready to take Zoom and make a recording. Boom, they come, I'm ready. I'm in the final tuning room, kind of downstairs. I could see that person in my mind's eye. Go, okay, they're coming to tell me he's in the Kronoa right now. They're coming up. And then I'm looking over at the screen like I'm doing right here. And also, I'm bum, 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 bum. I stopped the pipes, boom, immediately. And I got to telling them, listen, I know what's going on, but if you want quicker tuning, I'm all set up. Let's go. And now, mm -hmm. Bruce. Welcome. This is the Creef Highland Games, or this is the Aboyne Highland Games, and the tune they've chosen for you is Lord Lovett's Lament. Take your time. You might lose me on the screen if my screen blacks out and you've got your own recording running, right? Yep. All right. Good luck. And so I played that tune live like I was at a competition, and that was intense and fun. And it felt like, okay, I'm at the real games now. I just don't get to see everybody versus this taking six or eight tries. I, I lost total interest in that because would do one and done, or unless it was a disaster, I would do a redo, but never more than two. If it wasn't two, I'd just say, sorry, I can't make it. I'm still, I'm still doing what I do because I love doing it. You know, I, yeah. I'm looking over the top of this camera and my pipes are sitting there saying, okay, you got a Braddock Gorm Saturday, get on with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm having a great week just playing my pipes, going for walks. I'm busy working on my website. I'm developing, I'm near the end of developing a PBRIC fundamentals course that I've been wanting to do for a while, just to teach people how to play all the movements and the rhythmic passages in PBRIC. And I've composed a tune for it, just one to make it fresh and unique and avoid any copyright. And, and it'll be a nice entry level tune, not that simple, but easy enough for the, the players and new to them. So that's on here right now and just rebuilding that because courses are now quite popular for people. They want them. And, and I'm, building a, I'm building a membership group now as well that I'm, it's going to be a, you know, a group calling that'll have a lot of my stuff up there. Just making the product that I've been creating available for more people at a sensible price. I, and, and as my friend says, I, they call that running a business, Bruce. <laughs> Good man. That's well, it. thanks very much, Bruce, for your time uh, today. Thanks very much, Bruce. And all the best on Saturday, the, the London. That's it. Uh, thanks for having me, Alan. It's been great. Give them hell. Okay. Will do. Good.